F. E. Smith was a capable lawyer with a quick wit who served as the British Attorney General from 1915 to 1919. On one occasion, he cross-examined a young man who was claiming damages for an arm injured that, that supposedly came from a negligent bus driver. He said, will you please show us how high you can lift your arm now? The young man gingerly raised his arm to shoulder level, his face grimacing and distorted in pain. Thank you, said the lawyer. And now can you show us how high you could lift it before the accident? <laughs> Without hesitation, this young man shot his arm up above his head. And needless to say, he lost the case. This world is full of hucksters, liars, charlatans, and imposters who prey on the innocent. From the humblest profession to the highest seats of power, no office is safe from the likes of frauds and phonies. According to an old article in the Spokane Review, even the medical profession has its shares of counterfeits. I think that probably would have made a greater impact a few years ago. But it's true. Here's an excerpt from that article. It says, an estimated 10,000 physicians, 10,000 physicians have phony foreign medical degrees that bought one broker of fraudulent diplomas $1.5 million over three years. A congressional panel was told Monday. Claude Pepper, Democrat Florida, said, many American citizens may be receiving medical treatment from doctors who lied on their medical school loan applications and used the money not to go to school but to pay a broker for fake documents claiming that they had completed school and training. Pedro de Masonas, now serving a three-year prison sentence for mail fraud and conspiracy, told the panel that in three years of expediting medical degrees, he provided more or, or about 100 clients with false transcripts showing that they had fulfilled medical requirements of schools that they didn't attend. He says, quote, clients paid me from about $5,000 to $27,000 for my services. In all, I earned about $1.5 million in those three years. I only got to keep about $500,000 of this total. The rest went to bribes and expenses. I don't think any of us want a doctor with a fake degree, especially, especially when our lives depend on what they know. I mean, we all kind of despise doctors, especially now in this day and age, until we need one. But when we do need one, we want one who knows what's up, who knows what's happening. And yet we live in a world that is full of fakes and phonies. Liars, charlatans, imposters, they are everywhere, even within the church. It's a problem that has been with us since the beginning. And it will continue to be with us until every man is judged by Christ. But in the meantime, how do we know whether or not the spiritual leader is the real deal. Well, thankfully, false teachers are addressed all throughout the New Testament. And virtually every epistle responds to false teaching in one way or another. So we're told over and over again as we open the pages of Scripture what to look for and how to identify them. We're also told how to identify the genuine article. In 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul provides us with both as he defends his ministry against those who are accusing him of being a false teacher. They are saying that he is no better than a traveling salesman, that he strolled into town, he got what he wanted, and he got out just as quickly. They're saying that he is a coward, that Paul is a liar, that he is a, a self-made celebrity. He's a people pleaser, a moocher, and a glory seeker. And even the good things that Paul did when he was with them he did with the wrong motives. He did it for all the wrong reasons. Accusations like these are enough to cripple even the strongest man in ministry. It's hard enough to suffer for the gospel in the world, but when a shepherd discovers that those in the church are being poisoned against him, and all of a sudden they are assuming the worst about his ministry, about his motives, when that happens, it is hard to not curl up into a ball and cry or simply kick the dust off of your feet 
leave that congregation in the rearview mirror and say, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. That's fine. Maybe you don't need a shepherd. Have fun with the wolves. That's a real temptation. A real temptation. But you see, the real shepherd doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Instead, he, he, he stands up for the truth. And he corrects the error. He doesn't hide under the covers. And he certainly doesn't abandon his post. And that is exactly what Paul models for us here in this text. He stands for the truth. He corrects the error in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He defends his ministry. And he shows us exactly what it means to be a genuine shepherd. Please follow along as I read the introduction to Paul's defense. Starting in verse 1. He says... For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God, to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. I've told the story before about when I was younger. We had a real life bona fide false teacher come to our town and speak at a friend's church. He was a televangelist from the Trinity Bar Broadcasting Network, and his name is Jesse Duplantis. Perhaps you've heard of him. He claims that he has never been sick a day in his life, ever. And like so many others, he also claims that he has been to heaven. He has visited heaven multiple times. And I will never forget the message that he shared that night. He spoke about something that he called genetically altered Christianity. He kept waving his hands in the air and screaming things like, you don't dare accept suffering when it comes. You're a child of the king. You should expect great things. I mean, this world is full of weak and humble and, and pitiful Christians who take their lashings on the cheek and then they turn around and they give all the glory back to God. But friends, that is not real Christianity. That's genetically altered Christianity. I mean, you're not called to suffer. Why would God call his children to suffer? You have been appointed to rule. And he just kept yelling things like that over and over and over again. Sadly, the suffering people who were there that night, they ate it up. They loved it. At one time, he even begged the question. He said, what are you going to do when you get to heaven and you see what the streets are made of? What are you going to do? Are you going to shake your finger at the Lord and say, uh-uh, nope, nope, Jesus, that's not right. That's not right. Those streets should not be made of gold. They should be made of something more humble, more pitiful. No, of course not, because you're a child of the king. The whole thing was shameful. It was really shameful. After setting the bait, he then brought it home. He finished with an emotional fundraising campaign. He told us that we needed to replace his private jet with a Boeing 747. He said that the Lord wanted him to take more people with him on his crusades. Wouldn't it be wonderful if right there in Terre Haute, Indiana, if we could all pile onto a plane, fly up into the air, drop down in Kansas, have a revival, and then make it back home in time to go to work the next day? I remember him saying that and thinking, what's the point in that? Why would we go to Kansas? Indiana's bad enough. I mean, maybe that's why. Maybe they need the gospel too. Who knows? But either way, it was bizarre. Obviously, he needed a bigger plane, though. And that's how the gospel works. Not the gospel, but the prosperity gospel. This so-called preacher, what they do in this, in this system, in this prosperity system, is they, they teach that Jesus will heal you, and he will bless you, and, and all you have to do is step out in faith and sacrificially give them your money. So you give what little you have, and you hope that the Lord will multiply it like the loaves and the fishes and something about locusts in the Old Testament. I don't know. They have their proof text. 
but you give what little you have, hoping to see it multiplied. And then the huckster takes your money and he uses it to fund his higher life. That higher life then becomes evidence that his false teaching is true. And the cycle repeats itself. After all, God has blessed them. So why wouldn't he bless you too? Perhaps the most famous name in the prosperity racket is Benny Hinn. I watched him a few times as a kid. I remember him holding his hands out to the camera on the TV. This is long before flat screens on our CRT television. He would hold his hands out to the camera and he would ask people to place their hands over his on the set to receive their healing. I probably would have tried it, but my parents didn't want fingerprints all over the TV set. <laughs> so it's their fault that my grass cutting money never multiplied a hundredfold. <laughs> I wanted it, but oh well. Benny is the poster child for 2 Peter 2, for the book of Jude, for every other passage that describes the false teacher. In a book titled Greed or God, Greed, and the Prosperity Gospel, his nephew, Costi Hen, pulls the curtain back on Benny's lifestyle and ministry. He also describes what it was like working for him. Listen to this. He says, while I certainly behaved like a minister during the healing services, my hotel and nightlife behavior was a different story. On a trip to Paris, I roomed with my cousin at the Ritz-Carlton. Being a classy place, the Ritz had a dress coat. They couldn't even wear jeans. Well, my cousin and I let them know just how much we respected the Ritz dress code by trashing our room with a food fight. With our body clocks operating on Pacific time, my cousin and I stayed up all night ordering room service repeatedly and launched food at each other until the early hours of the morning. We behaved like spoiled children, staining the wallpaper with fruit and having no regard for the expensive furniture that filled the lavish room. In the morning, when we checked out of our hotel, barely a word was spoken about the incident. But one of the security personnel on our team gave us a stern talk. Apparently, they had forked over 5,000 euros to satisfy the hotel. My uncle never heard anything about it. He goes on to say the hypocrisy and wild behavior weren't limited to inside hotel rooms. On many trips, we frequented bars and nightclubs, spending thousands of dollars and enjoying our own version of prosperity living. Just hours after working in a healing service and putting on a gospel show, we would be out on the town with thousands of tip money at our disposal and our own security detail. We behaved like celebrities and racked up, racked up the tab. On top of all that, we were paid well for single guys. So having enough money was never an issue. Of course, this behavior served as evidence of our phony Christianity, but we just felt like we were blowing off steam. Thankfully, since then, Costi has gotten saved. And he recounts how that happens in this book. He recently planted a solid Bible-believing church down in Arizona. And we praise God for his work of grace in Costi's life because he has become a faithful shepherd. He has spent years developing and doing all the right things in order to bring him to this point. And God has worked a tremendous thing in Costi's life. Unfortunately, his faith-healing uncle is still out there swindling people out of their money. And 2 Peter 2 tells us that his condemnation from long ago is not idle, and his destruction is not asleep. In fact, 2 Peter 2.17 says that false teachers are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. In other words, God says, I've saved a table for you in hell. And you are going to pay for what you have done to my people. He goes on to say that such men are liars. Here in the word of God. In 2 Peter 2. He says that they are greedy. They are blasphemers. That they prey on the weak and they live for themselves. They are full of hot air. They pollute the waters of truth with destructive heresies. The Bible calls these men irrational animals. And creatures of instinct who are born to be caught and destroyed. In other words, the false teacher might appear to have it all together today. They might be living their best life now. But, church, the day is coming when they will regret the damage they have caused. 
Contrast the Bible's description of a false teacher with that of a faithful shepherd like we see in the Apostle Paul. Here is a man who speaks the truth, and yet he is accused of lying. He's beaten within an inch of his life, and yet he is called a coward. He's accused of running at the first sign of danger, and yet he never stops preaching the gospel. Why? Because he's the real deal. He is a genuine shepherd. Last time, we saw how God expects his leaders to be both tough and tender. He is to be a gentle shepherd, yes, but he is also to be a German shepherd. In verses 1 and 2, we have four qualities of the enduring Christian leader. He must be candid, credible, consistent, and courageous. We noted that when it comes to the wolves, the world, and the worldly, you don't want a gentle shepherd. You want a German shepherd, one who will be bold. You want a shepherd with teeth, one who will face opposition and say the hard things that might even get him killed. That's the German shepherd of verses 1 and 2. Today, we're going to look at the genuine shepherd of verses 3 and 4. He says, look, look, you know what false teachers are all about. You've seen them. You've experienced them. I've written about them. You know what they look like, but you also know that I'm not one of them. And so he reminds them of the facts. We have here two verses and two marks of a genuine shepherd. Now, in the, in the spirit of full disclosure, I have to admit, we're not going to get to verse 4 today. It's not going to happen. As I was preparing this message this week, I had every intention to cover both marks and both verses. As you can see there in your sermon sheet, just ignore the, last, or the, the back side of the page. Because I, as I started to work my way through verse 3, it became clear that I had a hard choice to make. I could either make this a really, really, really long sermon and apologize to the children workers again, or I could break it up into two messages on the shorter side and become a hero to all. <laughs> so, after a pregnant pause of deep introspection and a quick prayer, I decided to break it up. We're going to look at verse 3 today. Does that get an amen from someone, by the way? Okay. <laughs> so today, they told us in school, no one will ever crucify you if you let them out early. So hopefully that's the case. Today, we'll slow down and we'll focus on just the first mark, the genuine shepherd in verse 3. Next week, we'll tie it all together with verse 4. So what is the first mark? What is the big idea for this verse, the one truth that I hope you walk away with today? It's simply this. The German shepherd ministers with integrity. He ministers with integrity. That's what verse 3 is all about. He says, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. That word appeal, it's a very broad term. It encompasses everything verbal that Paul and his fellow missionaries brought to them. It certainly includes the preaching. We know from chapter 1 that their preaching was effective, that it was full of power and the Holy Spirit. But this appeal also goes beyond proclamation. It's an encouraging exhortation, yes, but it is also used all throughout the New Testament for pastoral ministry in general. It is synonymous for that. It is the act of verbally bringing God's word to bear on God's people when they need it. So this word appeal, it, it's simply a summary of Paul's ministry as he proclaims the gospel, but also as he shepherds the church. And he describes that ministry with three things that he doesn't have. He says, my message and my ministry, they are not known for error, impurity, or attempts at deception. Let's look at each of those, every one of these denials, one by one. But as we do so, let's flip them around into positive statements that do describe the genuine shepherd. If Paul is a true shepherd, and he says, here are the things that I am not, what does that tell us about what he is? Well, to begin with, he says that he has the right message. He has the right 
message. He says, his appeal does not spring from error, meaning that it springs from truth. It's not mostly right. It's not 98% right. No, it's absolutely right. He is not wrong about this. This word error, it's a very illustrative word. It literally means to wander from the path of truth. To wander from the path of truth. It carries this idea of straying, of meandering, of drifting away. It is a state of departure from a standard of truth. In Jude 13, this word is used to describe false teachers saying that they are wandering stars. They are stars who have spun out of orbit. They have lost their way. Listen, the genuine shepherd, he doesn't stray to the left or to the right. He doesn't try to improve on the gospel message. He doesn't add to God's word, and he doesn't hold back from saying what it says or soften his tone. Instead, he speaks the truth. He speaks the whole truth and nothing but the truth because he realizes that it's not his message to begin with. Let's peek ahead to the beginning of verse 4. What does he say there? He says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. This wasn't something they discovered. It's not something they made up for themselves. They didn't form a think tank or take a poll or strategize for the most effective methods of reaching the lost. No, their message was given to them by God. He entrusted them with the gospel, meaning that their words came from him. We see this all throughout the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. In other words, I'm just the middleman. I'm the messenger. I received it, and all I did was bring it to you. He's the cook. I'm the waiter. He's the editor. I'm just the paper boy. Please, I am just the messenger giving you what I have been given. That's exactly how I felt a few minutes ago when I was pointing out what the Bible has to say about false teachers. I mean, we live in a very polite society, but God uses very strong language to express how he feels about false teachers. He says things that I normally wouldn't say, because they're not nice. But I have to say them because he's right and I'm wrong. I can't let my misplaced sensitivities get in the way. My job isn't to edit his message or even tone it down a bit. My job is simply to say what he says. And that's true for all of us. That's true for every single person in this room. We must deliver what we have received through his word. Let's turn over for a moment to Galatians, to Galatians chapter 1. When Paul says that God has entrusted him with the gospel and that he is just the delivery boy, that is exactly what he means. Look at verses 11 and 12 in Galatians chapter 1. He says, for I would have you know, brothers, a term of endearment, but at the same time, I want you to know this, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He's saying the content of my preaching, it doesn't come from the word of man. It comes from the word of God. I remember thinking as a kid that I could never ever grow up to be a preacher. I didn't know what I was going to be, honestly, like most people. As a little kid, I was like, I love Mario Brothers. Maybe it'll have something to do with video games. Eventually, I got into programming. It's like, nope, that's not it. (laughs) God has certainly not called me to that. I thought, well, I love music. Maybe it'll have something to do with the music industry. Nope, not what the Lord had. I really wanted to be a pilot. Problem is, I was, I was, way too tall as a kid. I was huge. I I think I stopped growing like the fifth grade, if that gives you any idea. So I remember thinking, I'm going to be too tall. I'm going to be six foot seven. That's what they're predicting. I could never become a pilot. That, my eyesight is bad. They haven't invented LASIK surgery yet. It's like, what? I, I just, I can't do it. 
I can't do it. So the Lord just kept crossing things off of my list as a kid. But one thing I knew, anytime, whenever I thought, eh, I could be a preacher, immediately dismiss it. I could never become a preacher. Why? Because I couldn't imagine having to come up with new material week after week after week. The pastors I grew up listening to, they were all creative in all the wrong ways. They'd preach messages about how geese would fly in a V formation and how we needed to encourage our leadership by by falling behind them in a V formation and honking to encourage them and let them know that we're behind you, pastor, we're behind you. I remember that very vividly. My good friend Dave, his dad, Gary, actually stood up in the choir loft and started going, honk, honk, honk. We're behind you, pastor, honk. The problem with that is he did it for weeks. And like people would come and visit the church and they'd be like, who is this crazy honking choir member? What is going on? And my buddy Dave, he would just shrink down lower and lower in the pew. And of course, we would give him a hard time. Hi, oh, you're, you're the honking dad. Yeah. It, 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 was, it was wild. They would talk about the evils of burning CDs or getting tattoos. They'd practice newspaper exegesis and they would warn us. They would warn us that the end times had come. We're here, it's over. I remember thinking as a kid, how did they do it? How did they come up with all of this stuff, this fantastic, these fantastic sermons week after week after week? I could never do that. You give me a week's worth of topics, and I'm done after a few days. I'm just not as creative as some of these guys. You can imagine my relief when I discovered that you can preach from the Bible, that the preacher has more than enough material, when he uses God's material, when he doesn't have to come up with something creative week after week after week. It would take multiple lifetimes for us to touch every single verse that is contained in this book. And even then, we would only scratch the surface of God's truth that that is contained within these pages. The false teacher doesn't even try that. They don't do that. The false teacher, he doesn't tie himself down to the word of God. Staying in Galatians chapter 1, back up to verse 6. Some more strong language here. By the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What does he say here? He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel. But there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's about as black and white as you can get. He says, even if you take the truth and you twist it just one degree to the left or to the right, all it takes is just one tiny misstep to wander away from the path of truth. He says, if you deviate just a hair, from God's definition of God's gospel, guess what? You are deserting God, you are distorting the gospel, and anyone who preaches such a message deserves to be accursed, deserves to be damned. Listen, there is something worse, something far worse than a creative, motivational speaker who calls himself a pastor. The most dangerous kind of preaching in the world is the kind that is partly true. It's the kind that says, Jesus is the Son of God, who lived a perfect life. He went to the cross, and he died in the place of sinners. And to be saved, you need to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and fill in the blank. And fill in the blank. It's the kind of preaching that says, we don't worship Mary, We don't worship her. How dare you accuse us of that? But we will sing to her, pray to her, and kiss the feet of her statue. 
It's the kind of preaching that sparkles with a glimmer of truth, but misses the mark and leads you off into a path of darkness. The faithful preacher refuses to wander. He's too afraid to. He knows that it's not his message. He knows that he doesn't have the right to meddle with it. That this is God's message. The faithful preacher understands that he will someday stand before him and give an account that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. The faithful preacher refuses to wander. He's too afraid to. So he chains himself to God's revelation. He has the right message. That's number one. Number two, he has the right motivation. The right motivation. Paul says, look, our appeal doesn't come from error, but it also doesn't come from impurity, meaning that my heart is in the right place. The word for impurity here, it's a compound word, familiar word. It's catharsis with the prefix ah in front of it, meaning without. So no catharsis, without catharsis. If catharsis means to purge and to clean, and even though the word has changed and developed in its meaning over the years, it, it really hasn't strayed too terribly far from what it meant back then, then acatharsis means the opposite of that. It means to sit in your own filth. More specifically here, it is a state of moral corruption. It's the mess that is left behind from an unclean heart. Paul is saying I'm not in this for the fame, and I'm not in this for the fortune. I'm not in this thing to make a, a name for myself. And you know that that's true. We all know that that's true. Why? Because Paul was very good at being hated. Very good at it. As you read through the book of Acts, you begin to wonder, was there ever a town that didn't beat Paul or arrest him or run him out of town? If Paul was in it for the glory, he messed up big time. Big time. You see, there were those in his day who would travel from town to town, and many of them would do something similar to what Paul did. These traveling teachers, these impressive orators, they were called the sophists, and they made their living with their words. They would gather disciples, they would secure a venue, they would send them out ahead of time and send out invitations so people would know that they were coming. And then once they arrived, they would impress the crowd with an impassioned display of public speaking. Essentially, the sophists were the Roman Empire's equivalent of Twitter or Facebook. They were the top influencers. They were the, the ones with the check mark next to their name. They were the social media posters of the day. Back then, the people didn't have the nightly news. And they certainly didn't have the internet to help keep them connected. So they relied on these sophists to, to impress them, to entertain them, but also to keep them up to date with what was going on in other parts of the world. It didn't really matter if all the facts were right or not, so long as everyone was entertained and they walked away feeling good about themselves. They wanted to walk away feeling enlightened. They didn't know this before, but now, now that this has come across their feed, oh, I know more than, more than other people do. I know what's really going on. Why? Because... I didn't miss the sophist. I caught it. It's really all that mattered. The good ones were well paid. They became teachers. They would take in students and train them in the art of public speaking. So the greatest lawyers, the greatest politicians and actors, they would study under the most winsome and the most well-known sophists. Again, the only thing that mattered was perception. The goal of the sophists was to make you feel something so they could gain something. It's no surprise then that many of them were immoral. As they would travel from town to town seeking fame and glory, they would feed their appetites with all kinds of sinful behavior, and they would get away with it, much like how people get away with things today. Celebrities can get away with anything. Why? Because people love them. Because people love them. That's exactly what Paul's critics were accusing him of doing within the church. And that's exactly what prosperity gospel wolves are doing today. So you can see how easy it would be for someone to mount a smear campaign against Paul and say that he is just like everyone else. He's just like all these other great orators, these speakers who come into town. He's just like that faker over there leaning against the wall. He sounds good, 
He knows how to make you feel something. But even when his message is right, he's speaking from impure motives. Paul says, that might be true for the false teacher. That might be true for the sophist. But that is not true for us. We are not in it for the money. We are not in it for the fame. We are here for the glory of God. We're here to exalt Christ and see Christ exalted in you. We come to you with a true message and with pure motives. How can you tell? Because it's not about us. It's about God. It's all about him. It's not about me, and it's even not really about you. It's about pleasing the one who tests our hearts, and he knows that our ministry is fueled by the right motives. That's integrity piece number two, the right motives. The faithful minister has the right message and the right motives, and then finally, he has the right methods, the right methods. This verse ends with any attempt to deceive. Once again, he uses an incredibly vivid word to get his point across. This word deceive means cunning, treachery, and to take advantage of someone through underhanded methods. But quite literally, this Greek word refers to bait on a fish hook. It's a fishing word. You don't have to be a fisherman to know what this word is all about. For Valentine's Day this year, we don't always buy gifts for each other, but this year my wife bought me a t-shirt because she loves me. And for whatever reason, the shirt reminded her of me. In big letters it says, I love my wife. <laughs> I love my wife. If you saw me wearing it at a distance, you would swear that's all it says. But when you get closer, you notice that there's more to the message. In tiny print between each larger line, it forms a new sentence that says, I love it when my wife lets me go fishing. <laughs> it's a fun shirt because it promises one thing at a distance, lures you in, and then flips the script as soon as you come, come to it, as soon as you get there. However, there is nothing cute and playful about a baited hook, especially if you're a fish. Think about it for a moment. There you are, a fish. You see something shiny, delicious, and satisfying. And you think to yourself in your tiny fish brain, I want that. It's something that promises a full belly and a better life. And all you have to do is open your mouth and eat. Grab it. Take it for yourself. Today is your lucky day. It is being offered to you, free of charge. It's sitting there. It's waiting for you. There are no other fish around. You are the lucky fish to get it. So you open your mouth, you step out in faith, only to discover when it's too late that inside that delicious bait, there's a hook. It's a barbed piece of metal designed to drag you to your death or scar you for life. It's a vivid picture for the manipulative techniques that the sophists and the false teachers would use against their victims. They were known for stirring up the crowd, for creating an experience and luring the people into giving them all of their glory, their power, and their cash. And friends, it is the same thing today. It has not changed at all. The worst of them are two-bit con men who know exactly what they are doing. The best of them are deceived themselves. And they refuse to acknowledge the truth while they continue to live for themselves because they can't see past themselves. Regardless, they dress their lies with attractive colors while hiding the hook inside that will drag people to hell. Paul says, that is not what we are all about. That is not what we're all about. He didn't spend 30 minutes singing, 20 minutes preaching, and another 30 minutes yelling for folks to come down to the altar. He didn't finish his sermons with, at this time, I want to ask the musicians to come forward and make their way to the stage, heads bowed, eyes closed, no one is looking around. I'm going to count to three. I know it's lunchtime, but that gnawing in your gut, that's the Holy Spirit. Don't deny the Holy Spirit today. I'm going to count to three. No one is looking around. One, one, this is for you. This is for you. 
If you have lusted for, for someone of the opposite sex in your heart in the last 15 years, I want you to come down to the front. This is for you. I'm talking to you. Two, two. No, that's not how he operated. That's not what he did. He didn't manipulate them. He didn't look for decisions. He didn't promise them a way out of poverty, take a collection, and leave them to die. Instead, he preached the gospel of God for the glory of God. And then he stood back and to, to watch God work in their hearts. That's what he did. That's to say he ministered to them with the right message, the right motives, and the right methods. In a word, he ministered to them with integrity. With integrity. He didn't doctor the message with impure motives. He didn't dress it up with clever tricks and gimmicks. He didn't manipulate them. He didn't pull at their heartstrings. He didn't force them to feel a certain way and then make a quick or brash decision, not realizing that inside that flashy casing is a hook. He didn't do that. He simply brought them a true message with a pure life and an honest ministry. Because that is what faithful people do. It's the first mark of a genuine shepherd. He ministers with integrity. Integrity. We have looked at that word integrity several times already. Even recently in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's an important theme and an essential element for anyone who desires to share God's word, especially those who stand in the pulpit. For the Christian minister, it goes beyond being true to yourself. I don't think you're going to find that anywhere in the Bible. If anything, you're going to find the opposite. You're going to be told to deny yourself, to pick up your own cross daily, to follow Christ. You're going to be told to defer, to set aside your preferences to instead consider others, to esteem them higher and greater in love, to put their needs before your own and so forth. So integrity, as we look at it here within God's word, it goes beyond being true to yourself. It's all about being true to this book. It's being true to God and his revelation and what he would have for you. Richard Baxter, the 17th century English Puritan, he had this to say about the pastor's integrity. He said, it is an obvious error for all to see in those ministers of the church who make such a wide gulf between their preaching and their living. They will study hard to preach exactly and yet study little or not at all to live exactly. All the week long is little enough to study how to speak for two hours. Two hours, huh? And you thought one hour was long. <laughs> two hours. And yet one hour seems too much time to study how to live all the week. They are loath to misplace a word in their sermons, yet they think nothing of misplacing affections, words, and actions in the course of their lives. Oh, how curiously I have heard some men preach, and how carelessly have I seen them live. The standard is high. It's high for a pastor because... A pastor is obligated to live by the word he preaches. And people are watching him. They're watching him closely to see if he does. And we know that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So friends, I encourage you, look for these qualities. Look for these three qualities in your church's leaders, in your elders, in your deacons, your teachers, and your study leaders. Hold us all accountable and encourage us to greater faithfulness, yes. But please, please, friend, don't walk away from a verse like this and forget to apply it to yourself as well. Instead, ask yourself, am I sharing the right message? Am I proclaiming the word faithfully in my conversations Wherever God would bring me, those divine appointments in life, as he providentially orchestrates the course of human events on a big scale, but even on a smaller scale here in my life, who has he put into my life? Who can I pour into? Who can I speak to? Who can I encourage? Who can I share the gospel with? Am I doing so faithfully? Am I giving them my opinion or am I giving them the word of God? The powerful, ever-living, ever-true word of God. 
Do I have the right message? Am I proclaiming that message faithfully? Am I doing it with the right motives? Do I want to see people come to Christ and become like Christ for the glory of Christ? Or am I looking to get something out of this? Something in return? Am I looking for that glimmer in their eye as they look up to me as their spiritual leader? Do I, do I want that warm fuzzy that comes with a pat on the back with an attaboy? Am I seeking some kind of approval from man? Am I trying to, am I trying to put myself up Or am I doing it for the right motives? Is there any impurity in my heart? Lord, search me and make that known to me and help me to put it aside. And then when I do share the gospel with someone, am I using the right methods? Am I being true to the word of God? Am I simply proclaiming and sharing the truth and then trusting God for the results? Or have I memorized a formula or discovered a a cute trick that will make them more likely to sign on the dotted line. I appreciate what Warren Wiersbe had to say about this. He wrote, Paul did not trap people into being saved the way a clever salesman traps people into buying his product. Spiritual witnessing and Christian salesmanship are different. Salvation does not lie at the end of a clever argument or a subtle presentation. It is the result of God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, often we hear, I don't care what your method is, just as long as the message is right. Have you heard that before? I don't care about the method, just so long as the message is right. He goes on to say, but some methods are unworthy of the gospel. They are cheap whereas the gospel is a costly message that required the death of God's only Son. They are worldly and man-centered, whereas the gospel is a divine message centered in God's glory. Friends, it is simple. We can either do this the wrong way or we can do this God's way. The years are short and the days are evil. We cannot afford to play games or get cute with the gospel. We must appeal to the lost, and we must minister to each other without error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. We must become men and women of the book, full of truth, growing in holiness, and going about it all the right way. Who is the genuine shepherd? He is the man of integrity. He's the guy with the right message, the right motives, and the right methods. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for giving us your word. Lord, we read about these churches in the ancient world and all of the struggles, the pains, and the heartaches they went through both from without and within. And our hearts break for them on one hand, to see so many brothers and sisters in Christ suffer with broken friendships, lost relationships, with false teachers muddying the waters of true doctrine. Lord, it grieves our heart to read about such things. And yet, on the other hand, we are so thankful that these things happened. And now we benefit thousands of years later through your holy word. Lord, we see these things for what they are. God, I pray that you would continue to work within us, continue to bless this fellowship. Lord, if there be any impurity in us, Lord, make it known to us. Humble us, break our hearts before your holiness, before your perfection. Show us where we fail. And then, Lord, work within us to to build us up, to strengthen us, to encourage us. I pray that each and every one of us would humble ourselves so that you would be the one to exalt us. God, thank you for this word. Thank you for giving us the right message. Thank you for giving us your word, and thank you for filling our hearts with the right motivations. All that's left is making sure that we are faithful to employ the right methods. God, it is all an act of grace. From start to finish, our job is simply to open our mouths, 
to proclaim, to appeal, to provide the word that you have given as errand boys, as delivery boys, as waiters and not cooks. God, I pray that your spirit would work through your word to draw more men and women to yourself. And use us, I pray. Use this fellowship in our jobs, in our families, in our neighborhoods, all around the world as we conclude this missions month. God, would you use First Baptist Church of Arlington to bring more and more people into your glorious kingdom. Lord, we love you. Pray that you'll continue to bless this fellowship, protect it, build it up in love, and may you receive all the glory we pray. In your name, amen.